call the um, Chachi, or language is Chapalachi. They have a plant that was very important Bible crop for them. We've heard <coughs> several talks throughout this meeting as well as our visits at Q about the importance of fly for something sometimes we neglect. For the, for the Chachi, the two most important fiber plants were Carlodoca palmata, uh, which, in, uh, which they use for most of their weaving, but also a plant that they lost their Chapalachi name for because the plant had disappeared. And that plant they called, they referred to it as Chapalatillo. It was described by an anthropologist Barrett in 1925, but nobody knew what the plant was. So when you go and ask the Chachi about this, they would say, oh yeah, we remember this planet, so can I say un poco mas arriba, a little up the river. And you go up the river, no, un poco mas abajo. So I'm in arriba and abajo, and we couldn't find it. We ran into an embattled woman who had migrated from Colombia into Ecuador, and she eventually um, told us where we could find it, and it turned out to be Ishka Saifan. And if you remember, if you were on the Q, Q tour, and you saw the strainer from Manila, <coughs> the same plants and genes that used to make Menegar. Here's another one that had health implications. In 2003, we got reports in South Florida about children who were going into seizures after drinking a tea made from a star anise. It was quite common. There were some near-death experiences, and it was neonates that were being treated. It's very common for people in the Caribbean to give this tea to treat colic in kids that are two, three, four days all. So the state of hospital cases, and we were called in to help, and it was actually a little bit of a tricky problem because you can see from the packages up there that the fruits are sold whole, and sometimes they're adulterated. That was the ultimate problem. They had the wrong name on the plant. They had Elysium anisatum, which has this uh, terpenoid derivative down there that's toxic. But when you look at the package, you may have a package of 10 fruits with two bad ones, which means if you take two fruits to make a tea, you can get all bad. You can get all good or something in between. Moreover, when you do the forensic botany, if they've used the two bad fruits and you go look at the package, it's all good stuff, right? So you get to figure out what's going on. But again, it had to do with poor taxonomy, not knowing the name and not using the right material. We can look at literature. So if you remember Lord of the Rings, Aragon cures, first he cures um, Frodo with um, a plant that he called um, Athalius, but then when he got to Minas Tirith, he was trying to heal two, three people, Faramir, Lady Ewen, and Mercy, and they all knew what the plant was, but they all used different names. They couldn't communicate. They didn't have good taxonomy. Now, I will forgive Tolkien, because this was, this was pre name, right? Taxonomy. So we, we don't have to criticize him for it, but it would have been a lot easier. The book might have been a lot shorter, and they had good taxonomy. Now, if you go to literature, any literature, including our own journal, I'm sorry to say, any published literature, you can find taxonomic errors in any issue. That's not a problem. So rather than why I could, I could give you quantitative data, it, it might be frightening. Rather than that, I would just show you some of the, the examples. So often the binomials, very often binomials are miscited. They're misspelled. Misspelled. In the first case, we misspelled the generic name. And number two is misspelling of the specific epithet. You can see the second example is a trifecta. They misspelled the generic name, they misspelled the specific epithet, and they got the wrong name. It's the wrong name anyway, so even if they got it right. These kinds of problems are ubiquitous. Now, another th problem is when we talk about higher level taxonomy, and when you pick up a paper, unless it specifies the system that's being used, you don't know what a, a higher level taxon means. So this just shows an extreme example of what Liliaceae used to mean. And now Liliaceae has been broken up in APG3 into 10 different families in four different orders. So if you try to do something like um, a family analysis that I, I published a paper with a former student, Chad Husby, a couple years ago on a useful binomial system to look at patterns. Well, two, three of those families have changed significantly in their circumscription. So Zingiberaceae, that's fine, that hasn't changed. Pyberaceae hasn't changed. Lamiaceae, Lamiaceae today is very different from Lamiaceae 10 years ago. It includes most of the Verbenaceae. Um, Costaceae, no change. Apiaceae, a couple of genera that back, bounce back and forth, kind of a problem. Amaranthaceae today includes Kinopodiaceae, as well as other things. 
So you've got to know what family concept people are referring to when you read a paper and try to interpret any patterns in that paper. Does spelling count? How often do I get this? Uh, get this in class? Does spelling really matter? Well, yes, it does. Here's a common thing you see in on uh, grant review panels. Here's a couple of area. Everybody knows that why do you spell game? If you run a, a PubMed search on it, you spell it correctly, you get 104 hits. You spell it wrong, you get one. So suddenly you misspell it, and this was from a grant proposal seeking more than a million dollars a year to do research. They can't find any information on the car Well, you spelled it wrong. <laughs> but here's even scarier. All you look at this, you just look at the gene. If you're a botanist, you know it's wrong. But if you're a medical or plant researcher, you may not know it's wrong. Misspelling <coughs> anonymous or pineapple. I don't know what's scarier, but they misspelled it. Or if you can misspell it, you can publish six papers with the wrong name. <laughs> that also shows the level of review or the lack of level. That prompted uh, Mike Bailick and myself to write a paper, and we're coming out on a second paper on this, trying to help medicinal plant researchers. Uh, another thing, uh, author citations. We all know what they are. This is exceedingly confusing to people who don't understand taxonomy. What are, when it gets to plants with parenthetical authors, and some of them are easy, there's L period, and some of them have parentheses, and some have parentheses and slashes, and it's so confusing, why don't you just leave them off? Well, here's an example of why you should. There's two taxa that have been called Plutia carolinensis. Um, both of those are synonymous, one is now synonymous with Plutia synthetifolia, widely used medicinal plant. The other is a synonym of Canisa, totally different. So you go to the literature, you see the name Plukia carolinensis without an author citation. You don't know which taxon it refers to. So without that, without the citation of voucher and the author citation, that data, those data are useless. So the question is why? This is really simple. This is not rocket surgery, as I said. This is easy particularly in today's day, day and age with the access to databases. So why, does this, why do these kinds of things persist? So I love anthropocentrism. We're very, um, and some of this I say yes, but it's really serious. So I look, have to work a lot in the face with medical researchers. What do they study? One species, right? They don't study lots of everything. So when it, you don't have to write when you're doing a study on the effects of a drug on homo sapiens. You know what it is, right? But, one of the most common lab organisms used in biomedicine is this little worm-like thing, C. elegans. The only problem, C. elegans refers to 41 different species in the NIH database. So if you just use that abbreviated generic name, you don't know what it is. So that's part of the problem. Apathy and arrogance. Thank you. Apathy and arrogance. <coughs> People don't know about taxonomy and they don't care. That's quite common. I love this. Hello. Logophobia. That's the fear of Latin and Greek names. <laughs> so, but it's real. And I was talking to a couple of colleagues earlier this morning. My Spanish speak, my native Spanish speakers students always do better when it comes to Latin binomials as well as terminology because they're more cognate, so they don't have that fear. Um, nomatophobia is the fear of new names. Onomatophobia is the fear of the sound of names. But you know it's funny when you work with kids and they learn the names of all the dinosaurs, not a bit of fear. So we need to start earlier. Plant blindness, people have talked about that a great deal. Um, how we don't see the plant world. And finally, zoocentrism. Most of our, um, many of our colleagues and people we deal with are approaching uh, biology from uh, the point of view of animals. I call it all Voldemortism. You know, the fear of remembering, you couldn't say the name Voldemort, and we were fearful of that. So people can't say plant names because they can't pronounce them, they don't say them, they don't spell them, and um, we're quite messed up. So the solutions are simple. These are just a few of them. Too. So when you're reviewing papers and manuscripts and your students work, make sure that they have the name spelled correctly, along with um, the author citation. Synonymy is essential until we get databases that are smart, that can search on, uh, some of them do search on synonyms, all of them don't do it. Provide the um, source of the binomial, where did it come from, where did that name come up, you, you want to know that. And then when in doubt, ask plant taxonomists. This is my friend and colleague Doug Daly from New York, and um, plant taxonomists like to talk, especially about the things they study, so ask them. 
And I love this, but I want to end you with this. This was uh, King Philip of Spain, a Sinobotany teacher of the Royal Medical Society. These were actually Maurice and Vaughn, the, the two people that started. Um, to help remove pharmacists from the ignorance and rusticity learned either from the most abject common people or from the advice of their ancestors. So this, uh, this is an old problem. It was recognized 278 years ago. And it's just sad that I have to talk about this now, but uh, with your help, we can eliminate this problem. Thank you. And they were searching fuzzy logic, fuzzy names, you know. And I have some flyers if anybody's interested. That's all. Good, Michael. Yeah, and just another comment following up on what you said, Fred. I think it's absolutely crucial what you said, but one of the ways we need to work is not only at the level of what you basically talked about, the authors and the students. We need to think about how these things can be changed during the submission and review process. And speaking on behalf of the Journal of Pharmacology, Pharmacology, we're actually thinking about now forcing us as authors to really have a proper taxonomic check. Now, from a plant, medicine plant science perspective, that's a problem because we have similar issues in pharmacology and similar issues in chemistry. It's not naming, but there are other issues. So, but I think the whole issue of, uh, of scientific exact descriptions is something we need to tackle much more rigorously. And one of the greatest risks is the electronic age, and one of the greatest opportunities is are these electronic tools. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Taxonomy is crucial not just for us, but for every discipline. And because we're multidisciplinary, we involve lots of things. We could, uh, soil scientists could criticize us for our lack of knowledge of soil taxonomy, uh, medical taxonomy, classification of disease. Every discipline has this problem. In a recent paper, not on botanical taxonomy, but on taxonomy in general, Kalisher wrote that taxonomy is the way you let the world you know what you're, you know what you're doing. And I think that was said it great. We need to be better taxonomists all around. Two things. There are many standard uh, references, for instance, on the names of authors. So you could draw attention to Dick Brummett's uh, standard abbreviation of authors' names. And that is very helpful to make sure you've got it right, you know yes. who's who. Uh, secondly, uh, caution about you showed the capitate as one of the species names. Uh, well, that is always changed by spell checker right, from that's capitate to capitate. <laughs> and there are a lot of things like that, so you have to be very careful these days if you've got a spell checker on your computer. And that's that's very, I meant to thank you, I meant to point that out, and yeah, don't turn off your spell checkers. Thank you. So that's all the time we have right now. So our next talk is uh, we're moving to a different direction, gender bias.